welcome to the smartest moron. Say, do you remember that time I reviewed Final Fantasy XIII 2 and said there were way worse games out there? You know, to hide my misery as I tried to say something nice about it so I didn't just explode in like a blood-filled rage. From Square Enix, I've seen them write stuff that's worse than this. Way, way worse than this. Yeah! <laughs> I don't think I'm going to be able to ever top anything on this show with the amount of badness the third birthday has. Well, at least with full reviews, maybe. Though I have to admit, I find it hard to call myself a fan of this series when I only enjoyed the first game. If you read my text review of Parasite Eve 2, which I'll include in the description below, you'll know I consider it one of the worst experiences I have ever played in my entire life. Slow, outdated gameplay combined with a very weak story, and it disappointed me so damn much. And I wasn't a fan of Aya's love interest Kyle either. Despite my immense negative feelings towards 2, especially since everyone claims it's so good, I can recognize it as fitting within the Parasite Eve universe. It didn't really destroy anything, and it still had opportunities to continue the story. The third birthday fails to even meet that standard. Square had hoped to make this into a series, by starting on the PSP. That's already one strike. From what I could gather, it seemed that they no longer had the rights to use the name Parasite Eve, so had to come up with an alternate title, which works given how they basically rebooted the series. A reboot is really the only way to cover up what could be interpreted as gigantic plot holes in this game, such as missing characters or characterizations, though it doesn't help with the many other plot holes the story has. But then I keep hearing from people how it's supposed to be a sequel due to certain events, and, well, the number three in the title. So I don't know what to believe anymore. You know, Dragon Bleach could have easily solved all my problems. I'm just saying. But we're going to look at this game as both a sequel and as a reboot. And if you're already confused, well, imagine how I freaking felt. Development-wise, and I'm depending on some interviews I have read, of course, they wanted to reimagine Aya and introduce her to a new audience over doing a simple reboot. And there are a few more points of contradiction in these reviews that contrast with the freaking game. We believe that in order for Aya to stand apart on her own, we need to reimagine Aya and not create a simple reboot of the Parasite Eve series. The story evolved around this concept of Aya's comeback. The game tells us nothing of this Aya's past whatsoever, aside from being with Kyle, trained when she had amnesia, and had a sister who is not a clone this time. Oh, and the characters knew her too, and we barely know them. Some of the costumes were designed to get through the more difficult game modes. No, these fan service outfits were mostly designed so someone can jerk off to this, given how they tear apart just at the right spots. Hell, in another interview, some people on the team were wondering if they could do a shower scene like in Game 2. And yes, there is a shower scene in this game. Hope you like playing this game 50 times to freaking see it. Maintain a sense of realism when damaged or torn, I refer you to my last comment, and there was more stuff like getting help from the Final Fantasy XIII team, which explains a couple of things I'll get into later, and unlike with Jessica from Dragon Quest VIII, there's really no defense for this crap, as I'll get into later, so wait a bit before you fill the comments with chance of hypocrisy. Also, I did find out this was developed at the same time as Mindjack. You remember that game, right? The one that ended up breaking Angry Joe for the longest time? Yeah, they actually have similar concepts of body snatching and incoherent plots. So let's just see how this series was just able to just put one more headshot into the Parasite Eve series and kill it. This is the third birthday. And if my rage keeps up, <laughs> I may burn this thing to the ground. <laughs> the third birthday is a third person shooter RPG. I can now run and roll around, but this time you also have an auto-aim since, well, the PSP doesn't have a freaking second analog stick. The only exceptions are with heavy weapons and sniper rifles. Thankfully, you have a few types of guns to play with, and each one does have a good reason to be used in combat. You are only allowed to have three weapons at a time, though, and stuck with a crappy pistol with infinite ammo. This does raise the question, why the hell would I want another pistol to replace, like, one of my machine guns or shotguns? You know, outside of revolvers. Well, there are abilities linked to that, but more on those later. Speaking of abilities, Aya no longer has any of the mitochondrial powers from previous games. Instead, she is able to take over bodies with Overdive, which is necessary in order to survive in fights, given her lack of other attack abilities. 
So, shooting fire or healing herself? Gone. Turning into a monster from game one? Now replaced with a red aura transformation called Liberation. It works kinda similar to the Devil Trigger from Devil May Cry, where it ups Aya's attack power briefly and changes her attack style. And I mean briefly, as the meter decreases rapidly. Maybe good enough to kill one or two enemies, or hold up a boss while waiting for more soldiers to come and body snatch. There are other abilities, and this is where we start from being more improved from Parasite E2 controls to downright stupid. See, there's a thing called the DNA board. It's a 3x3 board where you can use DNA sets obtained from enemies when you overdive into them. Usually you get sets of 2 or 3, sometimes 1, each with their own skills, and when added, they can either change the skill already added or even enhance them. Now, this sounds simple, right? Well, here's the thing. What you stack on top of abilities can be random at times. True, some certain skills can create whole new ones, but getting the results you want can take a very long time and requires a lot of retries. If it didn't have the retry option or previewing, this system would be unimaginably torturing. Instead, it's just regular torture by wasting my goddamn time. I even had a guide and that doesn't help too much. This is literally all I do. I'm just mashing the square button and hoping success pops out. It's Final Fantasy 13 all over again. There are some useful passives like increased defense or liberation shots doing more damage, but others activate at complete random. Yes, I said random. It's like relying on rare drops in Dragon Ball Xenoverse. Except your life is on the line. Moreover, want to know how the other games handled upgrades? You either level up like in Game 1 while customizing your gun, or you gain experience in Game 2, pick what skill you want, and learn it. Why is there such a need for an overcomplicated system when in the past there were much simpler methods? It adds absolutely nothing, and it's not like the story ever goes into the technicals of our powers in the game. Also, there's one ability called Critical Shot that does make pistols more useful, but again, it's a randomly activated skill, so I never bothered wasting a weapon slot for that. As for the fourth weapon, it's usually filled by any soldiers you use, which is good for wasting on grunts while you wait to get more ammo for more limited guns. And odds are you probably run out of ammo too, since most enemies eat a ton of bullets. Usually you can use overdive on enemies to harm them, but it does leave you vulnerable, and it takes a while to be able to use it unless you hit them super hard really quickly. Now, the idea of combat is meant to use strategy and positioning soldiers the right way in order to keep switching out and damaging enemies, and even use higher or far away positions to hit the enemy when they least expect it. It's more problematic, however, in such tight spaces when the camera can sometimes be a problem, though it handles a bit better than I expected at least. Granted, when battles become too chaotic, a second analog stick to control the camera would have helped immensely, in particular with heavy weapons, as during this one boss fight against an enemy that can only be harmed by a specific gun, I need to reposition the camera to hit it, but by the time I do that, I already have to run the next second. So jump into another body, I hear you say. See, the thing is, the soldiers take much more damage than you do, so you can't just leave them to die. Even then, sometimes trying to save them is hard because the AI is not particularly good, and even when behind cover, they will still be shot to hell. They rely on you to live. The more chaotic a fight, the more frustrating this process is. And then sometimes, the game just pulls some pretty bullshit moves if you do not know their attack patterns. Later on, there's one enemy that can not only revive itself, but has to be killed a certain number of times or in a certain way, but it turns all soldiers, including you, into a monster. And it just turned my entire crew into monsters, leaving me dead in an instant. Still, with the right upgrades, it is possible to make some boss fights look really easy. And it's a shame some battles don't require more thought. Take these two first bosses. One has to be hit at from both sides while disabling limbs, while another, aside from using liberation for a quick finish, you need to knock these tornado thingies into it, then overdive into it to make it vulnerable. Not perfect, but it was something interesting. Everything after that is either stupidly infuriating due to speed, or surprisingly easy. Like, who knew all I needed to do was to use this cement to hide myself from these energy shots? This game is meant to be replayed several times, which would be a good thing if I wanted to play more. This does open up more opportunities to get better and different weapons. Your first playthrough will not net you much, and other weapons need to be obtained on higher difficulties, as do certain outfits. You can also complete certain feats that net you more BP, which might as well be money, and can unlock certain upgrades to buy for weapons as well as more stuff. Customization is thankfully present, but nothing to write home about. At least the guns are a bit varied, but since getting cooler stuff like the Pile Bunker requires playing more of this, I'm turned off. If the game didn't feature a dumbass DNA board, or was actually playable on console with two analog sticks, it would actually be far better. Also, you know what would have helped? Not screwing up Aya's abilities and just turning them into this crap. If she is strong enough to suddenly take over people's bodies, she would turn into the monster Eve! 
Both of the games hinted at this with the ending of Game 1 when everyone was suddenly under the control of Aya, and the boss battle in Game 2 where Eve, a clone of Aya, was transformed into the Monster Eve. As a sequel, it makes no sense for her to just take over bodies and yet not retain anything from either of the previous games. As a reboot, it manages to take away one of the strongest themes Aya has to her character, but more on that in the spoiler section. If there's one positive I'll grant, it's playing on the Vita as it does fix a complaint I have. Thanks to a friend of mine, AKA people I keep around for torturing. Oh, don't worry, Lewis, I'll get to you soon. You're going to review Colonial Marines. <laughs> and yes, I'll shove a link to his channel down below. He played this game on a regular Vita and was able to make the game work better by utilizing a second analog stick. Probably changed the controls around a bit. The result was a much better experience, as it is easier to line up shots and see more incoming enemy fire, as opposed to standing still and trying to turn the camera with a D-pad. So if you're itching to play this game, the Vita is easily the best option. Except I will not be lenient on the game, because this was made before the Vita came out. And it just further proves that this was better off being on a console rather than a portable system. There's also a closed ripping mechanic that was suggested by Tetsuya Nomura, and it's completely unnecessary here. For starters, it always manages to end up portraying Aya in a sexy manner, even despite all the damn blood she has. I mean, look at how the clothes ripping just manages to shape perfectly into like a bra and panties, showing off some of her ass and chest. Moreover, the idea of Overdive is to use her soul to take over a soldier's body, but her actual presence is still that of a regular armored up soldier. So, how are the clothes being ripped up? In fact, how the hell is she bleeding? Understandable if it's a soldier's clothes, but no one else is being stripped. Moreover, Parasite Eve doesn't need this. Aside from one shower scene in 2, where it wasn't even that raunchy, or, you know, dumbass artwork from the games, Aya has never really been portrayed sexually in-game, nor has an attitude that would support some of these goddamn outfits, not even her new self in this. Now, some may bring up the argument how I praise Senran Kagura despite some characters wearing outfits they maybe would not have worn. While well, I do criticize some designs, like the dumbass armor on Morikumo, and keep in mind that it's not me hating on Morikumo, it's just a freaking boob sock armor that's just... it's stupid! And also, here's the thing to remember. Senran Kagura is all about the fan service. And yet, as I proved with my review of it, not only does it have more of a coherent plot, but it has interesting characters and matched the fit in development of characters really damn well. Hell, while I do criticize Morikumo's stupid design, I still like her as a character. Whereas the third birthday, I can hardly remember their goddamn names and see them for maybe 20 minutes at best! And yes, it all goes downhill with the twist revealed. So, why waste any time? Let's just dive right into this frickin' story. Watch closely. Knowing your enemy will make your job easier. I didn't say easy. I said easier. Sir, my mission? Okay, so let's see how long the plot takes before it collapses in on itself, shall we? We do see New York under attack by tentacles, because I imagine the old American Godzilla is too busy being dead to help. There is actually a lot of destruction to show just how terrifying the situation is and demanding immediate action. Alright, so Aya no longer has her mitochondrial powers, she has to dive into people in order to make use of their bodies, and use guns as well. So how in the hell is she going to be able to solve this problem? Time travel! this are you stupid or what all right what the hell made you think a time travel story was the best idea for a reboot let alone this entire freaking series we barely know these new characters now some may say this can give interesting ideas and situations for aya to explore such as interacting with these new characters that'd be fine if we freaking saw the development a lot of this stuff is skipped and saved guess where no, I want you to guess how this is done, if there are barely any cutscenes that explain anything about the situation. Oh, don't worry, I'll wait. Do -do 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 -do. Time's up. It's freaking notes, aka the freaking data logs. Except, whereas in Final Fantasy XIII at least gave us flashbacks and showed some development over time, not all great, but hey, it at least tried, this game will suddenly skip events within the freaking story. 
And no, it's not just stuff from the past, but what is actually happening currently. Take for instance when Aya finds Kyle and asks him to protect Eve. It seems Kyle's on her side, but then Aya's base's operations are destroyed, everyone is killed, and Kyle's an enemy. There is absolutely no explanation for this crap on screen, so you have to go into your notes and figure out that Kyle did it. Now, some may say, well, it's revealed during his boss fight. Oh great, I have to spend an hour confused on a plot point that will take less than five minutes to explain unless I read. Truly worth it. You know, there's a reason why Chrono Trigger worked despite using time travel. It kept things simple. It focused on building characters in the world before shaking things up. This game, however, likes to try and shake things up all the goddamn time, but not give us enough of that to care about what the hell is going on. I hate to spoil the game more for those genuinely interested, but it's the only way I can truly explain some plot points never gone in depth. In Episode 2, there is a point where the gang is betrayed by Hunter Owen, who hates I and Caesar as the same as the Twisted, and has his own greedy reasons. The problem here is that he's never seen again, as he was killed off-screen, so whatever potential he had as a villain is completely erased. Or there's the next episode, where Kray is revealed to be behind certain events to see his daughter never mentioned before, except, you guessed it, the freaking notes. Considering Aya said she shot him later on, we apparently missed a scene where there was a boss battle just like that in the previous episodes. At least that's what it feels like, but reading the notes, apparently she killed him by overdiving into him. Oh, don't worry, that, that's actually a plot point later. Yet even with all the knowledge in the notes, there's not enough interactions between these characters. Gabriel and Cray are the ones I felt the most emotion for in their episodes, but they are killed off in those same episodes, so any attachment I have is gone. Oh, but what about Maeda? Now, in the original game, while a bit socially awkward and really interested in research, he was still a good guy that had a crush on Aya and did everything he could to try and help her, from Lucky Charms, no, not the cereal, damn it, to giving her what she needed to save the day. Here, though, oh, oh lord, no. I know it will. <laughs> How sweet your tears must taste. The scene... This scene is creepier if you know the freaking twist. Ugh. I'm not even sure what else I can say about the plot without going into super spoilers. Yeah, there's even more stuff I left out as it involves a major twist. A twist that actually made everything so much more worse. Though, here's a question. What about all of this is superior to the previous Parasite Eve, or on par with it? Aya's greatest strength was her compassion, and her greatest weakness was power as she feared turning into that monster Eve, or even into something worse. There's a reason why the secret boss in the first game is her liberated monster form. She was both a savior and a destroyer if she constantly interfered, but she's not the type of person to stand on the sidelines just to let people get hurt. Here, she is constantly afraid, and with her being an amnesiac, we are left in the dark about so much crap. Hell, she doesn't even react in a disgusted manner at Maeda's creepy lines, just smiling like it's nothing. Not even the original Aya would react in such a way, and the gameplay works against her morals as she constantly has to sacrifice soldiers just to progress. It already sucks to this stupid DNA board. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I'll stop mentioning that. This game manages to get so much wrong about a simple and kind character, and you can kind of see where the effort is put into with the level of violence, poetic speeches, and of course the needless and nonsensical stripping mechanics. Hell, even lightning, freaking lightning, has more to her character than Aya Brea here. It's why I'll never consider Lightning Returns worse than this game, because at least that game actually tries to focus on Lightning. Here, what is Aya? A damn near blank slate as far as we are concerned. I'm Special Agent Aya Brea of the CTI. No, no you are not. No, really, that's not Aya Brea. No, I'm serious, I'm not being bitter or anything. That is not Aya Brea. You have never been playing as Aya Brea this entire time! But, then who the hell is it? Well, spoiler time, kids! Aya Brea, you will be forced to commit another sin against your wishes. Now as for that twist, you know what? I'm just gonna play out the scene. I want you guys to spot it. Before I even say a damn thing. I've been hiding inside of you. I wanted to surpass the wall of time. Uh, I I'm Eve? Yes. 
You are Eve Brea. Time zero is when you dove into Aya's body, and that is when your memory was taken from you. Yep, it's actually Eve. You know, from the second game. The little girl, you know, who was cloned from Aya, so technically she is kind of Aya, but if we're going by this game's continuity and none of the other games, then technically she is Aya's sister, and about 10 to 12 years old, and you've been jerking off to a 10 and 12 year old in an adult's body. With all that shredded clothing. What the hell, Namora? And look, I get Japan as a thing about 13 year olds, or the lowest age to have sex apparently, but this was still disturbing, even if she was in Aya's body. Moreover, Eve is not 13 years old. At best, she was maybe 10 or 12 according to this continuity. And if this is a continuation, I still have a simple question to ask. Why do you do this? Eve still looks like a little girl despite the fact that she should be in her 20s by now. Now, the obvious answer is that the mitochondria slowed her body aging, but one, mitochondria is never mentioned, and two, you'd think she'd at least be a little bit older than this. That being said, I wouldn't mind Eve as the protagonist. She was already a clone of Aya, and so much of her life was robbed from her. Seeing someone like that with similar abilities to Aya, yet with a different background, could have potentially interesting stories. Unfortunately, she just doesn't matter in the long run, because we spent so much time assuming this was Aya Brea the entire time. Combine that with a rush story, that has a lot of plot points needing to be read in order to make sense, you don't care about who everyone is at that point. You just want things to make sense. But no, l let's just continue this nonsense for now. So Eve was able to destroy Aya's soul by trying to overdive into her when Aya was shot and seemingly killed by a SWAT team that suddenly interrupted the wedding. I'm serious, that, that's what started all of this. Okay, alright. Where do I even begin with the problems in this scene both in terms of a rebooted continuity and a sequel? As a reboot, Aya has very few friends aside from the people outside waiting for her. Um, why are her friends waiting outside in the freaking cold? A surprise or something? Pretty sure they are allowed in there. I'd ask if this was some Japanese custom or whatever, but they're in freaking America! They're in New York! Second of all, the SWAT team coming in to kill them. Never ever explained. It was hinted that Aya may have special abilities since they do say even after 10 years, her body hardly aged, but we never see what kind of ability she possesses outside of these new ones the writer just pulled out of their ass. Third, while I have no doubt an ambush will leave Aya a bit surprised and damage her, if she is still able to crawl to her gun, she should be able to fire off some freaking fireballs. Well, if we go by this game's continuity, just freaking overdive into them. It's not like they are twisted so they won't explode, nor are they innocent since they just tried to kill you and Kyle and the priest guy or whatever, really nobody cares about him, and endangered your sister and other friends. Fourth, when Eve overdives into Aya, how the hell is she suddenly able to kill the SWAT team? It's like Eve just suddenly gained a crap ton of skill despite probably never using a freaking firearm, because I can't really see Aya teaching her that. But even disregarding that, Aya's body was pretty much dying. When you overdive into people, sure, there's a skill in the DNA board that can help, except Eve wouldn't have that kind of capability yet. It's a lazy as hell plot point that could have been solved any other way. Fifth, the only reason I can accept a SWAT team coming after Kyle's because of events in the second game, where the president wants him brought in. Why? Because Kyle was a former agent and kinda fled, and knew some pretty big secrets. However, even that theory has flaws, and not just because of the changes, but because they just show up and assault them in the middle of the damn day! This is definitely something that could have been solved with a bomb or a sniper, something more discreet, poison even. Hell, not even Aya's so-called friends come to help, and two of them are supposed to be trained soldiers. You couldn't find another way into the church after hearing gunshots? Sixth, disregarding all of that. The games proved that normal humans could not fight those with mitochondria because they would get lit up like a freaking Roman candle. Why would you send, at best, maybe five soldiers to subdue someone who can punch a goddamn T-Rex to death? This game makes absolutely no goddamn sense. Every single time I try to dig and dig for more information, it's more concerned about its themes than its character or the entire story that it just doesn't make any sense. I just have to keep digging, digging, reading, reading, and nothing freaking makes sense to me. It's not enjoyable in the slightest. So what the hell were the writers thinking about this crap? I swear to God, the writers, they need to burn. They need to be purged. They need to burn, burn, 
burn, burn to the ground, burn to the ground, burn to the ground, burn to the ground, burn, 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 woohoo, burn, 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 burn. Hello and welcome back to the smartest moron. Do you feel like a rainbow, guys? Because I gotta tell you, I feel like a freaking rainbow. It's all thanks to this new medication I have. I oh, these. These are just crispy M&Ms. Huh. Regardless, they still make me feel good. They taste good, too. You wanna know what else tastes good? Nice, juicy meat on the grill as I burn the freaking writers of this game to the ground! Burn! 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 burn. smartest moron um you know i'm not feeling well after all that rage um i'll just go throw like a list of good games down here or whatever wherever the screen is i don't know hell up there too i don't care because lord knows you need something positive from this video all right so what did happen to Aya exactly you know after her soul was apparently destroyed well, after her soul was destroyed, the fragments were sent all across time and space, creating the twisted, and oh my god, this sounds stupid even if this wasn't related to Parasite Eve. This kind of plot point is supposedly how Kray died too, but nothing really major happened there. And if she can do that, why can't she just overdive into Hyde since he is clearly evil? Look, I'm done summarizing the stupidity of the High Ones, and I'm just gonna say this. No one cares. No one cares about this new threat anymore because of what you have done to the main story. I gave Final Fantasy XIII 2 a lot of shit for having the books explain stuff and being an incomplete game to boot. But the third birthday? That manages to rise above that level of frigging hatred. In 13 2, I can understand the conflict of Caius and Noel. I can understand why Snow acted like an idiot. I can understand why Lightning is in grief even though Sarah's death was not her freaking fault, it was freaking Atros. But this pile of crap this game. I don't understand who these people are. I hardly understand their motivations. Like I said before, the game doesn't give nearly enough time to show why we should care, why we should be invested. So when something happens, what the hell am I supposed to feel other than confusion when a twist is thrown my way? There is actually a game facts guide with a dumbass plot, and even that doesn't have all the damn answers. The game is trying to put whatever themes it wants to present over its characters, which is a terrible idea, as it is usually left with unnecessary twists, no development, and useless symbolism that one cannot understand if they aren't invested. Hell, even the frigging notes in the game are not too helpful either. This is easily the worst game to have a story, because at least with Dante's Inferno and the dumb reboot of Devil May Cry, or hell, even the new 52 of the DC Universe, is because you can at least understand what the hell is going on in them. There are clear characters for you to understand. Not great in some cases, mind you, but you can understand. Should I just review Chrono Trigger and just explain why time travel works in that frigging story in more detail? Or hell, even Radiant Historia. Well, granted, I don't have a DS recording device or whatever. But hell, either of those games are much better choices than this one for time travel. But... Let's get back on track to another important scene, where Ayabrea comes back, apparently, no idea how, and tells Eve that in order to fix everything, Eve needs to shoot Aya. Why? Well, because Eve's body was the source of the High Ones, so destroying both the soul of Aya and the body of Eve will fix things, or something. I don't know. Look, I'm just following the plot back. So after some refusing and hugging, the time comes as Aya switches bodies with Eve, and Eve has to pull the trigger. And the player has to pull the trigger, killing off the real Ayabrea once and for all to fix everything. You know, for as much as I rag on this piece of crap, for, you know, all the crap it just manages to keep screwing up, this is actually the one time Ayabrea is in friggin' character. You know, minus some bits here and there, but in character nonetheless. I'm serious here. The character is compassionate. She would hardly ever use soldiers' mere vessels or bullet shields. 
This is a character who stayed by Clamp's side despite all the evils he did, because she valued all life. This is a character who stopped Kyle Madigan from killing her clone, and risked her life to save that same clone, even as Eve turned into the monstrous Eve in Game 1. This was the same woman, who did everything she could to destroy giant monsters threatening those she cared about, from saving Daniel's son in Game 1, to saving a freaking dog in Game 2. She isn't the Punisher or Batman. She isn't Master Chief or Doom Guy. She's not even freaking Lightning. And you know what? She doesn't have to be. She's a caring person who would offer her hand to someone first, before ever shooting, if possible. So yes, I can believe that Aya would let herself die in order to save her sister, even if that same sister is just a clone. That, my friends, is Aya Brea. And we could certainly use more characters like her to show some goddamn humanity without being a goddamn idiot. Barring, you know, Game 2 moments. Unfortunately, my hatred begins to boil once more. Because as soon as you pull the trigger... That happens. I literally shouted, F*** you to my screen as it played out. A simple fade to black would have been very effective. But no, let's have the image of us shooting down one of the best female video game characters in the world stuck in our heads as all we can see is freaking blood. I honestly... I got nothing else. There's really nothing else for me to comment on. I just... What do you say after that? That's really it, aside from a scene that, once again, makes no sense. And of course, the shower scene. And considering the shower scene... Yeah, I'm done. Screw this game, screw its writers, and I pray to God we never see this crap ever again. If Parasite Eve wasn't dead after 2, it sure is now. for it at all. This is not just one of the worst examples of changing a series. This is one of the worst games I have ever played. Period. The gameplay started off fairly sound, but goes into bullshit territory with the DNA board and how combat is handled, not helping my hands being hurt during the entire experience due to it being on the PS freaking P. Combine that with a plot with no easy way to track what the hell is going on, requires tons of readings, and lacks any real character development aside from this version's Aya, and you have a real mess of a game that makes no goddamn sense, not even to fans of the series. It tries so hard to say something or be overcomplicated, it just collapses in on itself. While the game is short, it does have replayability, but to me personally, why the hell would I want to play more? I'm not getting off on Aya being stripped down, and this gameplay is really damn half-baked. I'll admit, I found it more playable than Game 2, but that's expected after, what, 10 years since the last goddamn game? Plus again, the dumbass DNA board. I'm the smartest moron, and, um... Yeah, I, I kinda need to clean up. I did not think that through fully. Um... Anyone got a dustpan? You know, with the bad crap happening in my life, ranting about this piece of crap was oddly therapeutic. Plus, unlike Dante's Inferno, I at least expected this one to suck due to a past written review. At any rate, you can check out two full reviews to, well, cleanse your taste of this crap. On your left is Dragon Quest VIII, and on your right is the good Parasite Eve game. As always, be sure to like, subscribe, comment, and share this video for others to enjoy. And I'll see you in the next video.